The following is a Common Sense Connecticut special presentation. Why you weather beaten gargoyle? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Stern with a Colgate Shave Cream Sports Newsreel. Whom do you see? It's Little Orphan Annie. Calling all adventure fans. Calling all Dick Tracy fans. Dragnet. It's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. It's smoke and it's flame. The march of time. Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the World. It is 7 o'clock. This is Bob Steele on WTIC AM 1080 in Hartford. WPOP. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Common Sense Connecticut. I'm Gary Byron. Tonight begins the first of a three-part series of the history of Connecticut radio. Tonight, we're going to discuss the history and a look back at Hartford Radio. My guest tonight, Sports Talk with Arnold Dean on WTIC 1080. We have the man himself, Arnold Dean. Also, staff announcer at WTIC and former anchor at WVIT Channel 30. Also, more recently, a spokesman for the Connecticut Lottery, Bill Hennessy. And next to him and to my immediate right, engineer at, uh, former engineer, I should say, at WHCN in Hartford. Currently, he's a station manager at WWUH, University of Hartford, and he, over at WCCC. He's the chief technical officer and also the author of a book called Hartford Radio. It's John Ramsey. Good evening and welcome to Common Sense Connecticut. Good evening. Glad to be here. Glad that you can all be here, actually. Bill, when you heard the intro that was just played, I would think a lot of emotions come, come to you. What's the first thing that comes? Well, not only about the Bob Steele part of that, but Bill Stern. Bill Stern was one of my favorites, and uh, he was a sports announcer on NBC. Matter of fact, he spent some time in Hartford at the Institute of Living because he was a legal morphine addict. No one oh. knew that, but his autobiography was titled A Taste of Ashes. And I guess when you're withdrawing from that addiction, that's what it tastes like in your <laughs> mouth. And I remember reading his autobiography. And uh, Ted Husing was his counterpart on, uh, I think it was CBS. And uh, they were both sports announcers. So I think back to those days, I'm old enough to remember, right. the only guy here older than I is. <laughs> <laughs> Your secret's safe with me, by the way. <laughs> I won't tell if he doesn't. <laughs> So that's what I remember. That's what I think about. Yeah. I, I, and, and, John, you've written a book that actually uh, categorizes all of uh, the different stations that we've heard and the evolution of radio, specifically in Hartford. But what was the impetus of your book, Hartford Radio? Well, Gary, I've been involved in radio as a broadcast engineer in this town since the early 70s and uh, have built up a career doing that. And about 10 years ago, I realized that I'd worked with some people that were even, some of them were no longer here anymore. And, you know, you're a young whippersnapper when you first start out in a business and you're, you're trying to get as much information as you can. But I didn't slow down and ask them what it was like back in their day. And one gentleman who was one of my mentors who's gone now is uh, Harold Dorshug, who I'm sure you remember from WTIC, yeah. uh, both of you. And uh, uh, he, he, I worked with him closely on a number of different projects in the 70s and 80s. Unfortunately, he passed away a number of years ago. But in, in prepping for a course that I taught at the University of Hartford on the history of radio, uh, I did some research, and one of the fun things to talk about for young people that, that may or may not be into radio is the War of the Worlds broadcast, the, sure. the Mercury Theater broadcast uh, that uh, panicked the nation. Orson Welles. Orson yeah. Welles. And uh, I was shocked to find out in doing the research, of course, with the Internet, it's much easier to do research now, that this guy, Harold Dorschach, was the master control engineer that night at CBS in New York. He was there. And I worked with this guy, and I never asked him what it was like or what did you do before you worked at WTIC. And I realized if, if people don't ask those questions, that information will, that history will be lost. So I started out uh, with a website, HartfordRadioHistory.com, and that turned into the book on Hartford Radio. Incredible. Yeah. And, and, and actually, you, going back as an engineer, 
mean, you, the people that you've met at the various stations that you worked at, they must have provided a lot of knowledge <laughs> yeah. that helped you Definitely. along with this book. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, stories in the book and a lot of photos that are thanks to the other stations' archives that sure. uh, would have been lost perhaps to, uh, to history if they weren't documented. There are a lot of topics that we're going to discuss tonight, and we're going to try to do this as interrupted as possible. And, and, and we're going to start, though, how, every, how each of you got your start in radio. Arnold, you've got a really, uh, we were talking earlier, you've got a really interesting story. Go ahead. Well, I started when I was 18 years old. I wanted to be a radio announcer. And they opened a, a station in my small town of Cortland, and I got all excited about it, and I went started hanging around. And finally, I got the nerve up and audition. And the guy said, uh, you sound, you like a, a decent voice. You read pretty well. Why don't you come and hang around at night, learn how to operate the controls and so on. And I did that every night, seven nights a week for about six months. And I got an opening and went in. And I made the, the, Eat the enormous amount of 50 cents an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I've never been happier. <laughs> sure. Well, because you're, you're doing what you love. Yeah. And I was living at home. My mother was still doing the laundry, you know, so <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you ended up going to Syracuse. I, later on, I went to Syracuse. That's when I left the small station. And uh, when I was at Syracuse, I got a job with the Syracuse station. And they said it had to be full time. And I said, I don't know. I'm a... Uh, I'm on probation as it is, academic probation, but I'm having a lot of fun, you know. And I'm thinking of joining a fraternity, and uh, the guy said this is a great opportunity, and he built a special schedule so that I could do both, and I, uh, my parents would have been disappointed if I hadn't. I took it, and from then on, I made the dean's list every year. My social life deteriorated at that point, <laughs> but, but I got my degree. But what brought you to Connecticut, then, well, in Syracuse? Well, eventually... My boss told me they couldn't continue to give me raises, is what it amounted to. See, Syracuse every year graduates about 2,000 people like as good as any of us. Yeah. And they're all ready to work any place to get, get it on their resumes. And uh, if you're raising three children as I was, one, three, and five years of age, and your wife, yourself, your first home, you can't afford to have that kind of competition. So I looked for a job for one year before I found WTIC was looking for someone. And I came and saw, and they conquered me, I'll tell you. you I know, loved it. Radio is so interesting because you start at one station, and you know how broadcasting is, radio or television. You, you'll, actually, you can attest to, both of you can attest to this so well. You end up traveling throughout radio station to station to station. You're unique, though, Arnold, because TIC is the only station in Connecticut you ever worked at. Yeah. What do, you, what do you attribute that to? That's unique. Oh, when I like something, I stick with it. <laughs> I, I like the station I worked for in Cortland, but then when I had the opportunity in Syracuse, I liked that one. The background that I got, I got into sports, and I did everything at one time or another. And when I left there, I was news and sports director, and I learned how to direct and everything else in the TV side. And uh, that gave me the background. And I could do play-by-play, -play, which is the thing that won my job at WTIC. Right. They needed an additional play-by-play -play -play man in addition to George Ehrlich. And when they saw on my resume that I could do that, that's what uh, opened it up for me. Who were you doing play-by-play -play for? The Hartford Knights was the name of the team. Mm. Superb football team. Wonderful, wonderful game. What year are we talking about here? Talking, well, I started in 1965 with a team that wasn't so great. Then when they folded up, around 1968 or so, the Knights came on and I did those games. Okay. And the Hartford Caps, which was uh, one of the minor league basketball teams. Mm -hmm. And I did some play-by-play -play with them. I did a few UConn games uh, okay. later on. I was the voice of Husky football. And my partner, uh, Bill will remember, was Lou Palmer who ended up at ESPN doing Sports Center and everything back in the early days. Interesting. And uh, we were the voices of UConn. He did basketball play-by-play, -play. I did color, and I did the football play-by-play, -play, and he was the commentator. Bill, your, your resume reads like a who's who of, uh, of radio stations and television stations as well. Can you take us back to what got you into radio and some of the stations that uh, you landed at in your career? Very similar to Arnold's background, too, as far as the desire to go into the business. I was a fan of a guy named Martin Block, a make-believe ballroom on what I still consider to be one of the finest radio stations in the country, WNEW in New York, mm -hmm. 1130. 
And uh, when I was in high school, I did a term paper on what did I want to do when I got out of high school. And I wanted to be like Martin Block. So I went to Emerson College in Boston, got a job at WHDH, working with a couple of guys named Bob and Ray, among others, and admiring Jim Britt and Tom Hussey, who were the Red Sox and Braves announcers back then, and Bob Delaney later on. And uh, my first year out, I was able to land a job in Waterbury, Vermont. There were three credentials you had to have to work there. The state hospital there for the mentally uh, <clears throat> disadvantaged was located there. Uh, you had to be willing to work for next to nothing, and you had to be crazy to go up there in the wintertime, and I did all three. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, radio, you, you have to work for next to nothing, even today. So. Well, I think I was better than Arnold. I was doing 75 cents an hour. <laughs> you started at the top. <laughs> <laughs> then I came to Hartford, which is my home anyway, sure. and uh, went to work for Bill and Max Savitt. Savitt Jewelers, 35 sure. Asylum Street, 35 Second Street, WCCC. POMG, Peace of Mind Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. They owned the radio station in the basement of the Hotel Bond, uh, 1290 on the dial, date timer, AM only, WCCC, which, uh, which I guess is the segue that takes us to Jack Ramsey because he knows all about what happened to CCC after the Savitz sold it. What are some of the other stations, before we get to John, that, that you worked at in radio as well? Well, I left TIC about two weeks after Arnold Dean came in. Oh, right. <laughs> Don't think that was coincidence, by the way. <laughs> so I left in 65 to go with an engineer from TIC named Bill Lobb, who's still around, and another fellow that Bill knew very well. And we formed a company that was famous for making the world's greatest microphone under the world's worst management. It was the Synchron S10 microphone, the world's first self-contained condenser mic. Without going into all the technical details, we lasted about two years. Uh, we sold mics to the Boston Symphony and, the, and New York uh, uh, Carnegie Hall, and we did some nice things, but not enough of them. We had another microphone, too, uh, later on, but uh, it didn't last. And the company went under, and I was forced into becoming what's called a freelancer. And that's when I started working at Channel 30, uh, freelancing the 11 o'clock news. And eventually, uh, WDRC, uh, WRCH, WRCQ, uh, vice president for a while of development at Connecticut Public Television. Anything for a buck before I finally got an honest job working for the state of Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> for the Connecticut lottery. Well, semi-honest. Yeah, yeah. well, they're quasi-state anyhow. <laughs> Where you do uh, some work right now. I do. I am the afternoon lottery guy. If at, I could uh, ask Fox. a question, if you don't mind. Did you ever try to come back to WTIC, Bill? I was disappointed when he left, frankly. He was sure. a lot of fun to work with. We did shows like Mike Line and so on, and it was really a lot of fun. You would sit at a table, you facing him, he on this side, and the control room here, oh. and I'll tell you, it was wonderful for breaking each other up, and we did it to the a utmost. Lot. A lot. And uh, it was such fun to work with him. Well, uh, I burned some bridges. Who's this guy we're looking at right oh. here? Well, there, there it is. When uh. That was taken, by the way, in the old WTIC-FM control. And that's you. That's a young Bill yeah, Hennessy. Yeah, that, that was uh, yours truly. And in that, in that particular studio, we ran combo. We spun our own records. Mm. They don't even have turntables anymore, no, right? No, no. <clears throat> It's all changed. Oh, yeah, they don't. It's a they totally don't, different world. Nothing's even on CD. Nothing's even yeah. on cart. Nothing's on cart. Nothing's yeah. on CD. Um, yeah, please feel free to answer his question. I mean, uh, did you ever get? Well, I, I shopped around, but uh, I had been the shop steward of After at TIC. Also, I should mention that, which didn't endear me to the upper levels of management. Uh, we are not always in agreement on how things should be done. But uh, no, I did try to get back in, and it didn't mm -hmm. work out. So that forced me to look elsewhere. And uh, one of the greatest guys in the business, not only in Hartford, but throughout the country, uh, gave me a break. Uh, and the news staff at DRC named Charlie Parker, sure, who was from Newington, the That's town right. that we're sitting in. And whose son is also working in broadcasting yeah. and also was at DRC in uh, POP, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And they had uh, beautiful facilities back in those days at 750 Main Street, which is where the original DRC home was. And they went out to Blue Hills Avenue where the transmitter's located. Then they moved back downtown, and now they're back again at Blue Hills Avenue. And uh, 
we had some some very good stations. C, uh, DRC was a carbon copy of TIC with a different network, CBS. TIC was NBC back in those days. Look at Main Street DRC right now. This, this takes you back, looking at... Uh, well, that's it. There's the big uh, call letters in red neon, WDRC. These photos are taken from your book, John. Let's go back to your beginnings in sure. broadcasting. and What got you interested in it? And well, I think I was probably 12 or 13, and my dad brought home a, a crystal radio set and, uh, to play with, so we got a chance to build a radio. That's where my technical interest in radio comes from, and I went from that to becoming ham radio operator when I was 15, and you know, right here in Newington is the world yeah. headquarters, the American right. Radio Star Relay. Out. Yeah. And uh, from there, I, uh, I got a chance to volunteer at the University of Hartford radio station, WWH. So I did my first show there when I was 15. And uh, part of that is getting your FCC license, so I had to go to Boston to do that. Uh, and I just got bitten by the bug. Uh, I come from a family of musicians. My, uh, my sister's a, a, a conductor. My father was a jazz pianist. My brother plays. Uh, so I love music, but uh, I, I'm not really musically inclined. <laughs> but, but so getting in the radio business was the next best thing. You're interesting, though, because you really you never really worked on the air that much. You're more or less behind the scenes as an engineer. Yes. Talk a little bit about that, and, and what made you gravitate more towards that end of broadcasting? Well, I think the, uh, the, my abilities were best suited. I was more technically inclined. Uh, I don't have the best voice for radio. Uh, it was more of, and I've never been the, that uh, much of a showman, so to speak, or a show person. So working behind the scenes was just fine because I love the technology. But it gave me a, a unique perspective on, on what was going on at Hartford Radio over the years. Sure. You talk about, you know, not being a, uh, a musician, but always but wanting to work in radio. It kind of segues perfectly into Arnold Dean, who, uh, you know, many people will think of, the, you know, when they hear the name Arnold Dean, they'll think of Sports Talk on WTIC 1080 for all the years that you've hosted that show. But truth be told, that's not your first love. It is music, in fact, and specifically yeah. big band music. Yep, I had an even greater interest in music. Uh, that started when I was in high school. They didn't have a saxophone. I was gonna be like my friend Jerry, who played the sax, because he said it's a great way to go out and meet a lot of girls sure. and everything, you know. <laughs> and I, <laughs> Bill went through this. He played the clarinet, too, yeah, as a yeah. matter of fact. Yeah. So we can share that experience. Uh, but uh, they didn't have any saxophones in the library there. But they said, we have a clarinet. Would you like to play that? And he put a couple of records on for me, and I listened to the clarinet. He said, that's what a clarinet sounds like. And I heard it, and I said, wow, I like that. I really like that sound. And it was Artie Shaw. And years later, I got to meet Artie Shaw, and I told him that of all the clarinetists, and I'd studied them all by that point, the one who really talked to me with the horn was him. And I said, that's what sold me on playing that horn. Didn't he, Bill? I mean, you mm -hmm. could hear that pear-shaped tone that we all thought we might be able to develop. And I had, my goal in life was to play the clarinet like Artie Shaw. And I even had an uncle who was an arranger, and he copied the solos from Stardust and his other classic recordings, even the clarinet concerto. And he gave me the music for it, and no matter how I studied, <laughs> I could get the notes right, but I never sounded like Artie what Shaw. What year are we going back to now? This would have been 1948. How do you go, though, from being this big band aficionado and even being a clarinet player yourself, okay? <laughs> and you've interviewed the greats. Uh, tell, tell everybody who you've, some of the people you interviewed other well, than Audrey Well, before Artie I Shaw. get to that, you know, the clarinet became such a love for me, I had to make a choice. Do I continue with broadcasting because I was already into radio by then? Or do I go into music, which my music and teach, teacher wanted me to do? He wanted me to go to Ithaca College and study clarinet. And then I got the job in Syracuse, and then I got an offer to join the U.S. Air Force Band. And I almost left school to go there, left college. My parents had a fit. So that's why I went back, and not only that, but they had me teaching beginning clarinetists. Did you ever do that, Bill? No, I didn't. There is no other experience like it. One beginning clarinetist is bad. I had a group of four seventh graders. <laughs> you never heard squeaking and squalling like that. But anyway, uh, I, I eventually went there, and when uh, Dick Bertel started a program called The Golden Age of Radio, wonderful series, and uh, he interviewed a lot of people like Fibber McGee and Molly and so many others, and it's a wonderful series that's even now on the Internet and uh, on our WTIC uh, alumni site, as is my series, the, golden, uh, the, the Big Band Era, 
the uh, one night stand with the big bands. And in mine, which was patterned after Dick's show, I interviewed Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, Harry James, Gene Krupa, Duke Ellington, uh, Count Basie, Ray McKinley, uh, you name them, I interviewed them. Stan Aronson, who came from Newington, played uh, saxophone with, uh, with Glenn Miller, recording of In the Mood and so on, and so many others. And uh, You have Dick Bertel here in the center here. In this yeah, that we're looking at. with Bill Hansen uh, on the right, he did Channel 30, 11 o'clock news for a while, and Channel 3 also, and of course, uh, that's, I think that's Bob Steele on the left. I believe it is. <laughs> Bill Hansen also did an all-night show on the WBZ in Boston before he came yeah. to Hartford. You know, Bill, a lot of the the evolution, if you will, of Hartford Radio. Can you, can you go into a little bit of that? Well, when I was a young man, <laughs> Arnold's age in 1948, about thereabouts. There were only four stations in Hartford at the time. Because uh, during World War II, the Federal Communications Commission put a freeze on new radio licenses. So why? We had, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but wh why? Why would they do that? Well, I guess it had to do with the wartime situation of, you know, trying to do technical things that wouldn't interfere with the military operations. Huh. And the same thing was true of television. Television actually started, you know, back in 1938 or 39, but was put on hold all during the war. And it didn't start out, I don't believe, in Connecticut until about 1948. Channel 6, which is now Channel 8, came on the air about that time. And it beat WBZ TV 4 in Boston by just a few hours. But anyway, at that time in Hartford Radio, there was WONS on Pratt Street, which was the Yankee Network and Mutual Broadcasting. There was WTHT, owned by the Hartford Times, hence the call letters, which I believe back then was in the Standard Building on Trumbull Street. There was WTIC, of course, at 1080, 50 watts, at 26 Grove Street, the Travelers Building in Hartford. And there was WDRC, the CBS uh, sound alike of TIC, on uh, 750 Main. And then after the war, when the licenses became available, uh, one of the first stations to come on was WCCC AM, only a 500 water, a daytime only. And then uh, other stations merged and consolidated. THT and ONS combined to form what was then called WGTH, which ultimately became WPOP, oh. uh, 1410 at that time. And the transmitter is right here in Newington, down on the swamp on Cedar That's Street. That's right. And it always was <laughs> there. And uh, THT's uh, frequency, which was 1230, eventually was taken over by WINF in Manchester many years later. And then there was another station, 840 WKNB, which is now WRYM. KNB was in New Britain, hence those call letters. And uh, WHAY came along, uh, WBIS in Bristol. Uh, a, lot, a lot of these stations have come and gone already. And KNB led to uh, WNBC uh, television. There had been a WNBC radio, by the way. Uh, that was in Newington. That's that correct. became WPOP. Right. Yep. In fact, they we're looking yep. at it right now. And that's that transmitter yeah. building is still there. Yeah. It's on uh, on Barely, Cedar Street. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was both the transmitter and the studios. And when you go by the building, you can't believe that they could have done both in a facility that small. But that's how it looked, and uh, stood for New Britain, Connecticut back then. But ironically, WKNB eventually became owned by. NBC in New York. All right, so that NBC is not the national broadcasting. No, that one wasn't. But it did become WNBC TV 30 on Corbin's Corner wow. in New Britain. Where you anchored it well, once Well, I time. did the 11 o'clock news for about 10 years. Yeah. In, in the 60s? Yep. And uh, actually, I did more than that because uh, there was a fellow named Jay Richard who's still around. Mm -hmm. He was best known for doing betting barn commercials. Sure. He was the weatherman. And he was going on a two-week vacation. What I cover, this is after I left doing the news, what I cover doing the weather for two weeks. And two years later, he came back. <laughs> <laughs> and then the betting barn turned into Charlie Parker's son, Steve Parker. Steve Parker who still does the betting barn. to this day barns. does yep. the betting barn commercials. Yep. So what goes around comes around. <laughs> and as you pointed out earlier, we all end up working at a variety of places, except Arnold Dean, who couldn't get another job. Yeah, I no, noticed that. <laughs> no, nobody else wanted me. <laughs> and John, your travels are pretty extensive as well. What, what causes an engineer to just go from one station to another to another 
And, and not just settling in at one station, because a good engineer is hard to find. I think in my case, certainly early in my career, just trying to, trying to better my career and uh, uh, go to a station with better technology that paid more. I, let, let's, <laughs> all right, oh, that's, a, that's a great point. So what stations back in the day were considered on the cutting, you know, cutting edge of technology for that period of time? Well, WTIC, bar none, uh, all along, you know, one of, the, one of the first stations in Connecticut, although not the first, but the first and only 50,000 watt station. There, as of you know, 1929, they went up to the highest power level allowed in, uh, in the United States, and uh, because of that, they had worldwide listenership at times. Worldwide, <laughs> worldwide listenership? <laughs> yes. Huh. Arnold was talking about getting calls on your show from, uh, from all over the country. Hearing they the listen to my show. Uh, one of the big band shows was Gene Krupa in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands. How does this happen? Uh, skips. <laughs> okay. uh, it's not something you can count on, yeah. but when I contacted the guy who advertised because he was looking for a copy of the tape of my second interview with Gene Krupa, I wrote to him because it was in Downbeat Magazine. He ran an ad, and I wrote to him and said, how do you know about that show? And he explained that they picked it up, and they had the whole series. So apparently it was dependable enough. And when I did sports talk at night, we got calls from 26 different states at one time or another. You know, I, I worked, when I started my career, I worked on AM radio, um, and I worked at a station on Wethersfield Avenue, WLVH. Um, I was actually playing reggae. Somebody had- Las Voices Spanish. Well, yeah, yeah. It's a, mm -hmm. it ended up becoming WLAT, Latino, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, but this is prior to that, it was LVH, it was a multi-ethnic radio station. I ended up playing reggae, if you look at me, you know, <laughs> but, I, but I craved radio so much that mm -hmm. I would have played anything. Um, and I got a phone call one time from, this is before the internet, so it was actually a, literally a phone call from somebody in Tennessee, and I didn't believe him. So mm -hmm. it, it was actually during the middle of a thunderstorm. How does that occur? It bounces off the atmosphere. It'd probably be a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 John knows a lot more about uh, it. There's very unusual things that can go on with radio reception, both AM and FM and TV. And uh, AM, it's uh, at night particularly, can go, can go thousands of miles. And remember, TIC at 1080 was basically a clear channel station. I think the only other one sharing that frequency was KRLD in Dallas. And uh, they used to do an antenna switch to protect each other's signals. As a matter of fact, one of the legendary stories about TIC <laughs> is Wynn Needles, a salesman for the station, long after the Travelers sold it, sold a commercial surrounding the antenna switch. Is that right? And now the antenna switch brought to you by so <laughs> and you hear <laughs> click. Which was five seconds of silence. <laughs> <laughs> John, you were talking a little while ago about how powerful TIC was, you know. But what are the origins of DRC? Because, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, that was the first radio station in Connecticut, right? Was it 1922? They're tied probably with WCAC, which was the Connecticut Agricultural College station in stores. Oh. That was the name of UConn before it became UConn. Uh, right? There was a lot of radio experimentation done there. And uh, the Franklin Doolittle, who's the D in DRC, Doolittle Radio Corporation, uh, was experimenting down in New Haven with, uh, with radio broadcasting. But it wasn't until uh, late 1922 when uh, Doolittle put on a, a station with a regular broadcast schedule. Before that, it was mostly broadcasting to hobbyists, and, or some of the broadcasts were actually shipped ashore. We're looking at the first studio, right? Yes, in New Haven, that was a WPAJ was the call sign when Doolittle first put it on. And uh, he was an entrepreneur and an experimenter uh, and a technician, but he also had uh, an appliance store. He was a retailer. And they were trying to sell these new thing, newfangled things called radio receivers or radio <laughs> sets, but there were no stations. During the day, they couldn't pick up the New York City stations. So a lot of these retailers put on radio stations in the back of their store to give their listeners, or to give their customers something to tune in on their radio. So wow. there's a picture in the book of his uh, appliance store with the WDRC studios in the back. A few years after WPHA, they changed the call letters to WDRC. From, for Doolittle Radio Corporation. Right. What made them move, though? A lot of people wouldn't even know that they started in New Haven. What made them move from New Haven to Hartford eventually, where to, to Bloomfield? I in, in the research that I did for the book, I found that uh, the reason for that is that CBS Network wanted a, a signal up in Hartford. Oh. They, uh, and New Haven was too close to New York City, where there already was a CBS radio station. So they moved it to Hartford to get the new, the, get the CBS network on in this in this town for the first time. Oh, so it's more of a corporate move then. Yeah, certainly. To, to, and along with the uh, the network came advertising. Hmm. Arnold, hmm. you you go from playing big band music 
and then you transitions. <laughs> you know, you do a complete 180. Yeah. You go from playing big band music and and knowing it. I mean, not just playing music. I studied because theoretically we can all play yeah. music at a radio station that we know personally yeah. enjoy. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we've all done that at some point. I know I have. But you knew big band music, as you've already, as you've mentioned. Well, but then you go into sports. And, and for the same reason, you know, I, I studied things like the Artie Shaw Band. I learned a little about arranging. I did consider music college at one point and a musical career. And so I knew quite a bit about it. But then when the show became available, it, now the show, when it became vacated, Bill left. He called it Hennessy, That's Me. And he did interviews on Constitution Plaza every noon. So when he left, I still have the memo at home, Bill, that uh, Ross Miller, our program manager, put out that they picked five announcers. They were going to give us each of the five the show one week, one after the other. And at the end of five weeks, they'd tell us who had gotten the show on a regular basis. Now, the reward was you got a talent fee for doing it. And also, I had Tuesdays and Wednesdays off. This meant you'd have to get one weekend day off. So now I had to have either Friday and Saturday or Sunday and Monday off. And my family was having celebrations. I said, well, (laughs) there are four other announcers here. But fortunately, I got the show. And once I did, my whole theory, even the week that I did it to fill in, was I told everything I knew about the records that I played. And we picked our own music. And I picked some that were mainly familiar to me, like the, the uh, things that uh, Benny Goodman did, his famous concert at Carnegie Hall in 1938, and things like that, so I could give a little background. And everybody found that intensely interesting. I figured you can't play scratchy old records without telling why they're valuable, mm-hmm. why you should listen to them. And then the more I got into it, the more I studied. I read books. I read Artie Shaw's book three times, The Trouble with Cinderella. And then I worked for about three years to get him on the air, too. Is that right? Yeah, it, it was impossible. But then you going into sports, again, I, yeah. I, I don't see the relation. Well, it was a necessity, again, and versatility that had got me the job, saved my career, really, because we were going to a new format. Remember, uh, Bill, you were not there at the mm-hmm. time. They were going to a talk format at night. We hired a, a, a controversial talk show the host from Boston, okay. to work seven till midnight. Whose name I do not remember. I'm sorry. Oh. I yeah, think you stumped the master here, huh? Yeah. I did. <laughs> I'll give you time to think about it because I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, did sports pay more money than playing big band music? Well, I mean, they were not going to do big band music anymore. Okay. Now they were swinging away from that, going more that group. Groups. Yeah, they wanted the uh, demos to improve to a younger audience. So that's why they were going to talk. Jerry Williams. Okay. Seven or five till uh, mid or seven till midnight, five hours. And then a guy named Bill Corsair was going to do midnight till five AM. And uh, so they called him tough and uh, terrible. Because <laughs> he was so controversial and right. everything. But uh, then they had a half hour to fill. Now, that had been the spot where I was doing the big band show. I knew we're not going to do a half hour of news at 6, go back to music, and then go all talk right. until 5 a.m. So I suggested, since I'm doing the sports from 6.20 till 6.30, why don't we position a sports talk show in there, which I'd talked about for years. Everybody had talked about it. Lou Palmer did, George Ehrlich did, and they always said, no, no, no. But we had the half hour to kill. I said that way we would start with the news at 6, do sports, do sports talk, transitions into Jerry Williams, and then uh, Bill Corsair. And we also continued with the agricultural show 5 to 6 a.m. before Steele came on 6 to 10. All right, I want to talk about Bob Steele. What was he like in the early stages of his career on TIC? Early stages? Well, let's catch Bill on that one because you knew him before I did, Bill. Well, the thing is, none of us here is old enough to remember Steele's early stages. The station, I think, signed on in 1925, and he came in right before World War II, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, He succeeded a fellow named Ben Hawthorne, uh, who did the G. Fox Morning Watch back in the days when there was a thing called brokering. Ben was an entrepreneur, basically, who sold 
G. Fox on the idea of running a radio show, and then he convinced TIC to bring that show over there, and that's how the G. Fox Morning Watch started. G. Fox was the major department store in Connecticut. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it was a beautiful yeah, place. Yeah, it was an, actually, you can make an outing of it. You can make a day well, of it. Well, the building is there. still there. Yeah. I think it's now a college or apartments or something. Ben Hawthorne preceded. He uh, preceded Bob, Bob Steele. Steel. Whatever happened to Bob Hawthorne before we go? Ben went into the Army, went into the new Armed Services, yeah. which gave uh, Bob Steele the opportunity. Okay. Yeah. And Ben did stay active when he came out, out of the war. As a matter of fact, he did a show called What's Your Opinion on WTIC Radio at night. Uh, that was on from, I think, uh, 8 to 10 or something, like maybe 8 to 11, because I was there at the time. This is before television. And uh, Ben also on television was the spokesman for Connecticut Light and Power, United Illuminating, on a very popular TV show called What in the World? We're looking at Ben Hawthorne right now, actually. There's Ben, and that's his cow, Bossy. <laughs> uh, and that's when he was doing the G Fox Morning Watch. But uh, getting back to this, how Steele got involved, Steele was a staff announcer, basically. And then he was doing motorcycle play-by-play -play when he came to Hartford. And uh, apparently the story that I've heard, and I think it's in the book too, is that uh, he was going to go to a movie, and the movie had just started, and the gal on the ticket counter said, why don't you come back when it starts over again? What was he going to do to kill time? He walked across the street to uh, the Traveler's Building. It was actually 26th Grove Street, but it was next to the Marble Pillar. And he walked up and took an audition because TIC used to conduct auditions regularly, and he clicked because he was a natural. Not only Steele was a great personality, he was a naturally good announcer with no formal training in it. So this was his first and only radio job. And he lasted, I think, 60 years. Yeah. And there he is with uh, Ed Anderson, formerly of Newington, Bruce Kern, uh, who lived in West Hartford, and I don't see who that is in the extreme right. But those are four of the announcers in the early days of Bob Steele, before Arnold Dean and I got there. <laughs> Looking at another person, another pioneer in radio, and a lot of people may not think that this person had anything to do with radio because his name is so synonymous with jewelry, and that was Bill Savitt and Savitt Jewelers. If you all remember, P-O-M-G, Peace of Mind Guaranteed. Um, but he goes back even before, we're looking at uh, Bill Savitt now, Bill Savitt created, he and his brother, excuse me, created WCCC. What, why? Well, Max Savitt was a judge, and uh, Bill, of course, was the famous jeweler, and uh, when the frequency opened up to buy an AM radio station, they put it on the air. They also, by the way, put on, I believe, one of the, they bought the first franchise for cable television, and they never put it on. They sold it before it really took off. So they, they knew what they were doing, and they were good business people. And they were, by the way, very good bosses. Uh, we never were interfered with in anything we did. A fellow named Ralph Klein, whose son is still practicing law in Hartford. Ralph was the manager when I worked there. He came in after a fellow named Paul Martin, and they put on the uh, WCCC TNT on CCC, Time, News, and Temperature. And it was a very successful independent station because the other stations all carried network programming and or baseball. So that if you wanted to hear something other than network programming and baseball, the only music station at the time was 1290 WCCC. Interesting. And that was true for quite a while. Wow. John, <clears throat> behind the scenes, there, there's a lot of... Well, there's a lot of unsung heroes that I'm sure that you've crossed paths with at various radio stations that you've worked at. Can you mention a few? Well, getting back to the, uh, the WCCC for a second, uh, Gary, one of the, the interesting stories that I came across in the book, a gentleman by the name of Ivor Hugh uh, was on uh, WCCC when it first went on the air in 1947 as a record librarian, and he stayed on the air through the 60s. He's now on WJMJ. He still does an evening show oh, there. Wow. He told me a story about doing mornings on WCCC AM back in the 50s, and he said it was a low-powered station up against some very high-powered stations like WDRC and WTIC, but because most of the population in the 40s was within five or ten 
10 miles of downtown Hartford, it didn't matter. You know, Simsbury was way out in the boondocks back then. It wasn't as populated as it is now. And he talked about waking up one morning. Of course, weather forecasting wasn't as good as it is now. Waking up one morning in the late 50s, uh, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, and there was a terrible blizzard going on. And he realized he was not going to be able to get to the Hartford, let alone out of his driveway. Sure. So he, uh, he called Bill Savitt uh, and said, Bill, you've got to get one of the guys that lives downtown to come in and start the show because I'm not going to get there. And Bill said, get dressed, stay where you are. 30 minutes later, he hears diesel engines outside, and the National Guard was <laughs> digging away to his front door. So he, he gets there, and uh, he, he drive, gets driven into the station and goes home that evening, and gets on the air and goes home that evening and says to his wife, you know, I didn't know my, my show was that popular. And she goes, it's not you. It's Bill Savitt knew the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Who are we looking at right here? That's, that's Ivor that's Hugh. That's Ivor Hugh. Yeah. Yeah, he's a wonderful gentleman, uh, very knowledgeable with music, has done a, sh a couple of shows on WJMJ in the last 20 years, uh, of r r regular shows about music. And he came in frequently and did things at WTIC while I was there. Yeah. Yeah, well, great guy. He was involved with religious broadcasting, too, as mm -hmm. the communications director for the Greater Hartford Council of Churches. Uh, that picture, by the way, shows him with hair. He's still around, but he doesn't have the hair. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing a show, Good Evening, Good Music, uh, probably... At night, uh, right by people may be watching this if it's played back at the right time on WJMJ 88.9. What goes on behind the scenes, though, at, at a radio station? Crazy because stuff. Because people, I, I, I would imagine, <laughs> people always hear the radio personalities, yeah. you know, but in order for them to come across as, you know, personable and, 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 and charismatic, you need the engineers. They have to be on the air. Yeah. What goes on behind the scenes? Well, our, our, you two mentioned how uh, when you were sitting across from each other doing oh, Mike Line or whatever, all the things that went on. I mean, they, sometimes it's really hard to see the talent totally cracking up and maybe uh -huh. telling jokes that wouldn't be appropriate for on air. The moment the light goes on on the camera or the microphone light goes on for a radio station, they go back and become the professionals that they are. So it's a great to see that. Behind the scenes, though, the uh, uh, engineers certainly do a lot of work. Uh, the salespeople make it all possible because most of the stations are commercial. Without the commercials being sold, there's no, it's a business of radio. There's no radio stations. In the old days, copywriters, you had people pulling the music and doing research on that uh, for the broadcasters. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Even today, with, it's uh, much more automated than it ever was before, but there's still a pretty big staff behind the scenes making the radio station. Gary, engineers uh, have a lot to do with making a show sound as good as it is. Right. Bob Steele loved to work with a guy named Bob Downs in the control room because Downs had a way of controlling Bob's temper, and Bob was one of those who was a perfectionist. And if you did a commercial on his show, you were going to be perfect, too, or you'd pay for it. I mean, he was brutal to work with if you didn't do your job well. So you'd better be well rehearsed. And he also looked for fine points, too. Uh, uh, he would help you out with pronunciations. He said, Arnold, you say a little bit, maybe it's from your upstate New York background, but you say Poughkeepsie. It's not Poke, it's Poughkeepsie. Just touch a little bit of vermouth. <laughs> Kipsy, you know, and that's it, and uh, so on. But he was a real stickler for things. And I remember Downsy would get very upset with him, and Bob would be upset because the commercial ran two seconds over, it ran 62 seconds instead of 60. And he would have a fit. He couldn't live with that. Or a piece of copy came with a word misspelled. He went crazy with that. And uh, then he would complain the whole time a record was playing, and Downsy would simply say very quietly when he was all finished with his rant, he'd say, Bob, take the money and run. <laughs> and Bob would say, I know, I know, Bob. <laughs> so you know, I had on this show one time for a segment was um, Brad Davis. He was, mm -hmm. I had him as a guest on Common Sense Connecticut. And um, he's, he was really emphasis, uh, excuse me, really emphasized the relationship that a radio station must have with its advertisers. Of course, his big thing was milk, if you remember back in the day. Uh, and you've, we've all heard him you know, speak at, on, at uh, private events and, and stuff. But um, the relationship that a radio station or even a radio announcer has with an advertiser, mm -hmm. significant, isn't it? Well, Brad does a particularly good job of being very close to his advertisers, and so did Bob Steele. Uh, Bob, Bill, Bill Savin owned WCCC. Right. He advertised very heavily on Bob Steele, his competing station. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He advertised his jewelry store. Oh, t Bob Steele and TIC were, uh, and, and Bill Savitt were a combination that was very well entrenched. Uh, when Bob Steele read your commercial, if you had a car dealership, well, let's say Savitt, 
Yeah, if you wanted to advertise Sterling Jewelers on Bob's show, Bob would not read your live commercial because that would Constant dissuade interest. you from sure. listening to what he had said about Savage. Would it cost more money to have your advertisement read live I'm not by, sure they, by I don't think I don't think they charged a premium, but one of the things that evolved at TIC is uh, because of the shortage of number of minutes for advertising purposes. If you wanted to buy a spot on the Bob Steele show, you had to buy one in the afternoon too. Yeah. So Yeah, was, that's right. Yeah. The drive time. Yeah. The but maximum uh, the maximum traffic pro plan they called it. Mm -hmm. You had morning drive and you had afternoon drive. And you had to buy them both in order to get steel. Interesting. In case you're just joining us on Common Sense Connecticut, a special edition that we have uh Today, uh, this evening is a history of look back at Hartford Radio. We have a sports talk with Arnold Dean on WTIC, Arnold Dean himself, staff announcer on uh, WTIC, also former anchor at WVIT Channel 30, Bill Hennessy, and the uh, former engineer at WHCN, current station uh, manager at WWUH, University of Hartford, and chief technical officer over at WCCC, and the author of this book, which I want to hold up, John Ramsey. I want to make sure that we get a, a good shot of uh, the book that... Um, that uh, John has written, you've all must have some really funny or anecdotes or stories, if you will, um, over the years that uh, I wish we had time for all of them. Um, but when some of the Believe most me, we famous tell you stories, all of them. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 I know some of these because we've, we've met previously. Um, what are some of the stories? Well, we'll, we'll start with, with you, Arnold, and we'll work our way here. Well, we talk about the engineers. Uh, there was one named Bob Sharego who uh, retired recently from... <laughs> Voice of America. Bill smiles, uh, yeah. Bill smiles immediately thinking about some of the shenanigans he pulled in, in the control room. Anything to break the announcer up. You know, that was their pastime. And one day, Bob was engineering the steel show, and you didn't mess around with steel. That right. was good behavior in the control room. But Steele was telling the story. It was just the two of them there. It was early in the morning. Steele mentioned he walked, gone for a walk yesterday afternoon, a beautiful day on Main Street. I decided to buy an ice cream cone. And at the time, you know, they had the phone set up, public phones along the sidewalk, no cell phones at that time. And he said, I decided I had to call somebody. So I had this ice cream cone, and I reached in, and I got the change, and I held a phone, and I put the change in, and suddenly the person said, hello. <laughs> And I stuck the ice cream cone <laughs> in, my, in my ear. <laughs> and he said, only with steel would that be that funny. But he said, there's a word for that when that happens. And from the control room, the soundproof room, Sherego said, yeah, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and steel actually broke up. Wow. I think the only time he ever broke up. And he had a very serious demeanor. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. But that one struck him. But he had a great sense of humor, too. Well, you ha you and, have to in this it, industry. Well, it showed in his, in his show every day. He did uh, all kinds of things that were humorous. And, you must and, have some funny stories over the well, years. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up where Arnold left off about Bob Sherego, but I won't <laughs> mention the name of the announcer on whom he inflicted this. His name has come up in this conversation today. <laughs> but uh, there was back in the days when we were at, uh, before they had broadcast house, we were in the Travelers Building. WTIC, AM, FM, and TV. And the announcers worked all three. So one of the announcers whose, as they say, <laughs> name will remain anonymous, was running the FM show. And for some reason, the station went off the air. And he came running down to the master control room where Bob Sherego was ensconced. He said, we're off the air, we're off the air, what do I do? And Sherego says, you go back into the studio, open the mic and tell people we're off the air, but we expect to resume broadcasting shortly. And yeah. the announcer supposedly went down and did exactly <laughs> that. Of course, that <laughs> but that doesn't even make any sense. No. You know? <laughs> but that's the kind of things that happened. Did Steele ever try to break you up, Bill, before you did a commercial? No, no, no. no I, he got I me once. Uh, he How, what was your relationship like with him? Mine was pretty good, really. But we had our moments when... Uh, Really? Yeah. I wasn't as intimidated by Bob. I didn't grow up listening to him, you know, like the others do. Yeah, so didn't. when they walked in, you're working with God. But with me, I'd worked with a lot of other pretty well-known people by then. And I thought, you know, he's very, very good. But, you know, he's just another announcer, really. Uh, well, now, nah. is, is that no, fair? Or? I know, but you... you 
I know, but he was very special. He absolutely was. We'll never work with another like him. There will never be another like him. No. But uh, he didn't mind if he broke us up. And uh, I had a commercial one day, and I'm sitting there waiting. I had to go into the studio to read it if you were doing the competing spot. And I was sitting there waiting. So he told the story about the guy who was up before the firing squad. And uh, the uh, commander went over and said, do you have any last request? And the man spit in the commander's face. The commander looked at him and said, hey, are you looking for trouble? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my reaction. I, I, and he went like this, your turn. And I turned on the mic and I paused, got my wits about me. I turned on the mic and I started to laugh. I couldn't help it. And he thought it was great. He loved it. Sure. He got me. John, any, any any funny stories that you can recall over the years as a as an engineer? And I think most, the scenes? most of the ones I are were from as a radio listener. Uh, I remember a couple of uh, unbelievable April Fool's jokes that uh, some of the local stations did. One of them was WHCN back in the 80s uh, on April Fool's Day switched from a rock format. They had been a progressive rock station to a country format. And, oh. uh, and we, I was over at WDRC at the time, and you know, stations notice things instantaneously. When the competition does something different, you notice it. So everybody said, listen to CCC. And it was pretty hokey. It was really twangy, Conway Twitty type. Oh, old well, school. Old Country school music. stuff. Yes. And the announcing was really bad, really kind of hillbilly-like. And we thought, oh, this is it's April Fool's Day. It's got to be a joke. And then there was a, a spot that came on, which was Boyd Arnold, who's a name not known to most of the people that aren't in the business, but he's one of the most respected general managers back then and even now. He's at WCCC now. He came on, this is Boyd Arnold. I'm the general manager of the radio ranch. You may be shocked at the format change, but we're really excited about this for the 80s. We're going to be doing this. And we all said, oh my God, it's real. Boyd would not go on the air and, and, and lend his credentials to this if it wasn't real. And then, of course, three or four hours later, they went back to doing rock. Well, I was going to say, did, did anybody realize, well, what's today's date? It's April Fool's Day. If you're, I mean, to pull a joke, yeah. how about the yeah. day before or the day after? Because yeah. then you, you know. start. Every year at April Fool's Day, yeah. April 1st, Bob Steele would announce his retirement. And, of course, it was a joke. But every people would still got, fall for it. Every, every year, year every, they fell for it. The same people fell for it every mm -hmm. year. You know, you talk about the 80s. You know, we're talking the evolution of Hartford Radio and the personalities and the engineers and even the equipment um, that just seems so primitive when you look at some of these photos that are in your book, John. Do you think Bob Steele, just to bring him back into this, just for a brief moment, would he be as popular today in the competitive world of, of radio? You gotta, you gotta remember now, you're competing against satellite radio, you're competing against iPods, um, and you're competing against Howard Stern and Don Imus. Syndicated yeah, and voice tracking. I mean, yeah. the, the whole industry has changed so much. We're going to talk about that in a second. But bringing this right back to, to um, Bob Steele, would, would he make it in today's well, morning radio on, on top of it? Number one, no one could ever have the command of an audience the way he did. Where other people talk about having a 12 or a 14 now, and it's, it's great. Bob Steele must have had 50s and 60s. Wow. Just everybody, the other stations might, might as well have not signed on in the morning, still owned them. Uh, and not, but the competition is too much now. We had 50,000 watts, we had the biggest staff, if you wanted school closing, you had to tune in Bob yep. Steele. Well, Bob Steele was number one in the country, was yeah, he not? Yeah. yeah. And I asked him once, I, Bob, I, we, we got to know each other even better after he retired. I felt sorry for him because without the job, he was lost. He told the story himself of Jimmy Durante when he was asked, why do you keep working although you're in your 90s and you still make one night stands? And he said, I don't need the money, but I need the work. <laughs> and that was Bob Steele. That and becomes part of your identity then. It. It, they have a hard time he being, was lost without not it. being the character that everybody knows. I let me, let I, me put in a plug for, for Bob Steele's legacy. His son, Phil Steele, who is a lawyer by profession, has compiled a whole series of Bob Steele's, I can't think of the title, but it's Bob Steele's era of Bob Steele's generation. It's a series of uh, books, uh, well published, ni nice glossy paper and mm -hmm. nice photographs of the letters and pictures that made up Bob Steele's personal memorabilia. And uh, there's a collection of it at the Harvard Public Library. Nice. And there are some at other libraries around mm -hmm. the state so that uh, his memory will linger, but his audience, of course, is, is getting as old as Arnold and I, 
And so there won't be as many of us who remember him personally in the future, but it's still available, and it's a lot of it's in John's book too. I mean, yeah. no other announcer. He, you know, he was for the people that don't know Bob Steele. Uh, you know, he was on the same station for 60 years. It is in a business where if you're on the station for three years, it's right. a long time. So, and he also, as we mentioned, had the highest ratings. Uh, uh, Phil Steele said that there was some evidence that uh, that he had an 80. 80% of the audience at, at one point in the late 60s. Yeah, but incredible. but he was routinely in the 50s and 60s. So, you know, one out of every two people listening to the radio were listening to Bob Steele in the morning. I, I listen, I'm running out of time, but I, I, I want to just do a, a quick comparison of radio back in the day. You know, we're talking the 40s and 50s, 30s and 40s and 50s, actually, you know, uh, and radio today and how technology has changed, uh, how it's all computer. Uh, uh, there, there's cart machines are gone and, and CDs and vinyl, of course, vinyl's long gone. What do you think of radio today? And if you were to do a comparison or contrast even between yesterday and today, on the air, and then I'm going to ask you about behind the scenes, and because that's really a technical question, but really quickly. I'm glad I worked in it when I did. I don't think it's the same at all. And I think Better now... Better or worse now? Oh, much worse. It's not nearly as good a field to work, and they don't have the amusement that we had, the times that we had, the friendships that we grew up with. Bill, Look, is it too corporate? We have we have reunions uh, yeah, with the old do. WTIC group, which Bill formed and keeps that organization going. Is it too corporate? Well, it's 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 become much more focused on being a business than being a medium. And uh, what drives radio it didn't used to be quite the same way. When the Travelers owned TIC, for example, they would have a lot of what you call sustaining programs, orchestras and things that didn't have commercial sponsors, and it didn't matter. Now that's what drives the whole industry. It's less fun as a result well, of that. Uh, there's no live studio orchestras anymore. There's uh, there's not even live, not many live radio personalities mm. anymore. A lot of it is voice track. Syndicated. Yeah, and syndicated yeah. shows. Yep. What about from a, from a technological perspective, um, going back in the research in your book and how primitive the equipment was and the evolution up to today's computerized equipment. Yeah, in the book you'll see a lot of pictures uh, to what you alluded to, Bill. Uh, TWTIC back in the 20s and 30s had a symphony orchestra, they had a chamber Live. music orchestra, yeah. they had a jazz ensemble, they had dozens and dozens of musicians that would play, uh, partly because the uh, the technology for playing back music, you know, the transcription LP was out there, or actually there were 78s back then, they weren't really good quality. There wasn't a, loud, a large selection and there were also some, some uh, either union or copyright regulations about playing them on the air, so it's cheaper for them to have an in-house orchestra. Interesting. I'm, I'm running out of time. I just, I got about a minute left. Uh, what are you doing now, Arnold? I'm still working. Uh, I'm working tomorrow night. I'm doing sports talk, which I'm happy to say I started in 1976. It's still on the air. Yes, it is. And I'm very proud of that. Mm. And uh, I uh, do interviews with the president of the University of Connecticut before athletic events, a number of things like that. So I still have my foot in the water. Good. And Good. I love every bit of it. The, the oh. gang is still great. I can tell. I can tell. Bill, what are you doing now? He gets to go to all the UConn games. I, I know, right? <laughs> That's right. The perks of, of working I still radio. do some background advertising for an automobile company in Bristol, mm -hmm. the Crowley Auto Group. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple of national TV spots running, but it's still freelance. And I'm basically retired and loving it in Niantic on the Atlantic. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Enjoying it. Yes. John. Well, I'm excited because I was recently given a radio station. I'm trying to bring back old-time radio. Uh, WAPJ in Torrington is a small community radio station that I helped put on the air back in 1997. And uh, the gentleman that, uh, that owned the station turned 90 last year, and he gave my wife and I uh, the, the license to the radio station. So I have a small community radio station in Torrington. Wow. It doesn't cover much more than just that part of Litchfield County, but it's on the Internet at WAPJ.org. And we're trying to do radio like it was done back in the day. We're, tw we're live about 12 hours a day. We've increased it from eight hours about six months ago. Uh, Dan Lavallo, who was on WDRC sure, for years, yeah. is doing an afternoon show for us five days a week now. Uh, so we're trying How many to watts? It's a 40 watts, 40 but it's a, a, a 1,300-foot antenna uh, up on a hill, so it covers about half of Litchfield County. And with the Internet, of course, you can pick it up anywhere. How often has somebody handed the keys <laughs> to a radio station? <laughs> it was wow. a, yeah, once Holy a, you, John. Once a lifetime opportunity. So we're, we're trying to do radio like it should be done. I'm glad you got Dan. He's a good man, and I'm glad he landed there. He's a great guy. You know, it's interesting with all three of you, and you can, you can see the passion. It's so obvious when you talk about your careers. And what also I find fascinating is that all three of these gentlemen 
regardless of age, regardless of how long they've been in the industry, they are still active somewhat in their, in their profession. It, it, radio really is an addiction, yeah. isn't it? You get bitten by it's, the bug. It's a bug, and yeah. that, that's the right word. John uses it, everybody in the industry does. In, in, in more so than television, it's more theater of the mind. I, I was particularly back in the day. I preferred I, I radio, so. yeah. So, yeah. But some of us were given the choice of radio or TV when uh, the original when Traveler sold it. I chose radio. I want to thank our guest, uh, Arnold Dean, well known for sports talk on WTIC for so many years. Also, Bill Hennessy, staff announcer on WTIC anchor uh, back in the day on WVIT Channel 30, also spokesman for the Connecticut Lottery. Uh, was around for WCCC at its, uh, oh my goodness, when it began. Also, John Ramsey, former engineer at WHCN, an author of this book. Please, you can get your own copy by visiting HartfordRadioHistory.com. You're looking at a copy of the cover of the copy right there. I'm Gary Byron. Thanks so much for watching Common Sense Connecticut and be looking for part two. Have a great night. <laughs>